Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the conclusion to part three of his Prologoma to Any Future Metaphysics, one of the topics that Kant is going to begin to explore that's really quite fascinating is what it is that reason is actually about. And he's not going to engage in a full critique of pure reason or practical reason. Those are other works, but he is going to dwell on why it is that we cannot get away from the transcendental ideas altogether. We can't just push them off and say, ah, we can't know anything about those sort of things. Why are we, as rational beings, inevitably drawn in to thinking about these matters? So another way of framing this, given a term that Kant is going to use, why can we not simply leave noumena completely aside and stick to just the phenomenal world in you know, what we're going to see later on as the project of a school that is called positivism. So what we're looking at here is the completion and satisfaction of reason, which is a completion and satisfaction for ourselves as rational beings accompanying Kant on this, this journey through the prolegomena. So he's got this great line where he's going to say, uh, the begins here, um, we cannot beyond all possible experience form a definite notion of what beings in themselves may be, yet we are not at liberty to abstain entirely from inquiring into them. Why? Experience never fully satisfies reason. Now, the terms that he's using there uh, he says, völlig genüge, so it's, it's more of a noun than a, a verb. You never attain a complete satisfaction uh, on reason's part, right, from experience. But in answering questions, refers us further and further back and leaves us dissatisfied unbefriedigt, right? So there is no befriedigen with regard to their complete, völlig, solution. And so he says, this anyone may gather from the dialectic of pure reason, which we're going to talk about in just a bit. But notice the idea here. We have completion, which we've already seen plays a massively important role earlier on in this section. And satisfaction, an affective term, right? And what's really remarkable about this section is that Kant is not going to use emotion language, but he is going to use the language of a broader affectivity. Reason has desires or longing, reason wants, right? So this is quite important. And then he's going to talk about the dialectic of pure reason is having shown this to us. And he's going to, you know, talk about the psychological and cosmological and theological ideas. Why do we have to engage with these? He says, who can refrain from asking what the soul really is? And if no concept of experience suffices for the purpose from accounting for it by a concept of reason, though we can't prove its objective reality. So we're stuck, right? We can't not think about the soul. I mean, there are other options, right? We can dismiss it. Ah, there's no such thing as a soul. We can be materialists. We can 
uh, you know, have other ways of, of rejecting it. But Kant says that those aren't really going to satisfy us. But our concept of the soul isn't going to satisfy us either. And then he talks about who can satisfy himself with mere empirical knowledge in all the cosmological questions about, you know, the nature of the universe, its extent, or freedom or natural necessity. And he says, notice that each of these answers raises new questions. We don't find a resting place in them. And then finally, in the ideal of pure reason, the theological idea, who does not see in the thoroughgoing contingency and dependence of all his thoughts and assumptions on mere principles of experience, the impossibility of stopping there. So we're, we're confronted with a problem. And interestingly, Kant is going to talk just a uh, little bit earlier about the end and use of our reason, right? Reason's end and use is what leads us into metaphysics. So there's a purpose, a goal to reason. It's one that reason itself can uncover for itself. And reason can regulate its own use, its own nutzen, right? So how is this actually going to work? And why is it that metaphysics is going to lead us into this? He says, metaphysics and its fundamental features, perhaps more than any other science, is placed in us by nature itself and cannot be considered the production of an arbitrary choice or casual enlargement in the progress of experience from which it is quite separate, disparate, right? So he says, reason with all of its concepts and laws of the understanding, those have been outlined earlier in the work and are outlined in the Critique of Pure Reason, are adequate, hinreichen, going far enough for empirical use. Great. So if we're looking at things within the world, if we're doing uh, pure mathematics or even pure natural science, wonderful, right? Those are uh, not empirical sciences, but they are ultimately of things that are met with in experience. And here Kant says, <clears throat> there is, however, no satisfaction, no befriedigung, no resting in being at, you know, a completed state, we could say, finds for itself no satisfaction. Why? because of, and he uses two different terms here, because ever recurring questions deprive us of all hope of their, notice, complete solution, right? So completion is also built in here. And then he talks about uh, problems. He says the transcendental ideas which have that completion in view, right, um, are such problems of reason. So we have questions. We can't, we can't answer all the questions in part because new questions arise and we have larger problems, which are the transcendental ideas themselves. So he goes on and he says that the sensible world cannot contain this completion, this, you know, being brought to its perfection or its finality, however you want to understand vollständigkeit, right? So it's not just the sensible world itself. It's also, as he says, the concepts that we uh, grasp in terms of space and time, and even the pure concepts of the understanding, like the categories, they don't give us a completion that we are inevitably, as rational beings, through our faculty of reason, seeking out. So we remain unsatisfied even when we're satisfied with one part. We're like, that's good. This is excellent over here. It's just not everything I was looking for. <clears throat> so why? He says, the sensible world is nothing but a chain of appearances connected according to universal laws. As that, it's wonderful. But it doesn't have any subsistence by itself. It is not the thing in itself. And consequently, now notice this, consequently must point to that which contains the basis of this appearance to beings which cannot be cognized merely as appearances, but as things 
in itself. Now, we can say, well, why, does, why do these empirical matters connected together in such myriad cool ways that we've you know, outlined before, why do they have to point beyond to something? And if we're really being strict about this, they don't point beyond. Reason looks at them and then wants to go beyond them. They don't do the pointing themselves. They're just what they are, and they're connected in some way to things in themselves, to noumena. And it's reason which is drawing these connections and being oriented by this desire. So what we find is uh, the cognition of things in themselves, which just in the next paragraph, he is going to call noumena once again, and he's done that earlier in the work. It's only uh, in cognition of these alone that reason can, now notice this, hope to satisfy its desire, its verlangen, for completion, nach vollständigkeit, um, in proceeding from the conditioned, the empirical things that we observe, to the conditions or the conditioning, the transcendental ideas, which are giving us some idea of what the noumena, the things in themselves, possibly could be, but not knowledge of what they actually are. Now, again, I pointed out this affective dimension, hoping, satisfying, desire. These are all words that bear an affective resonance to them. So this is well worth pointing out and thinking about. Now, Kant is also going to talk, as I mentioned, in the next paragraph about the noumena. What is the relation of reason to the noumena? He says that the transcendental ideas have urged us to approach them and have led us to the spot where the occupied space that is experienced touches the void, the leeren, the empty, uh, where, uh, you know, that of which we can know nothing, that is noumena. He says we can determine the bounds of, of reason. So the void is actually beyond the bounds of pure reason in this case, right? And... Um, this is going to lead us, he's going to talk about the, the supreme being in just a moment, and we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So he tells us that we can never cognize these beings of understanding as they are in themselves, right? So we, we can't actually know them. However, now he said this a little bit earlier, we must therefore think, and here he talks about the three different uh, ideas, classes of ideas, because uh, cosmological is plural, right, of pure reason, we cannot not think those. We can't get away from them, at least if we're thinkers, right? So he says that um, in them only, as things in themselves, reason attains only in this, does reason find that completion and satisfaction, now notice again this term, which it can never hope for in the derivation of appearances from their homogenous grounds. And here again we have the conditioned and the conditioning or the conditions, right? So reason can't avoid trying to seek out this completion and satisfaction in the transcendental ideas, but we can't know them. We can't know the things in themselves. We can't know the noumena, except, well, we're not knowing them and we're not cognizing them determinately, right? determining them, but we can think them, as he says, by means of such concepts as express their relation to the world of sense. So if we represent to ourselves, he says, a being of the understanding with nothing but pure concepts of the understanding, we represent nothing determinate to ourselves, so our concept has no significance. But if we think of it by properties, 
borrowed from the sensible world, it's no longer a being of understanding, but is conceived of a phenomenon and belongs to the sensible world. So we can't make much progress, indeed any real progress, except by thinking the noumena purely in relation to the phenomena. Now, is that actually going to provide reason with a completion and satisfaction that it desires, that it longs for, that it hopes for? Not exactly, but it's going to get it closer than merely resting with a adequate in itself, adequate to itself, but inadequate to reason, phenomenal world.